Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> for this week, our sermon series brings us to a new section in the Gospel of John. <clears throat> if you'll just excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> excuse me. We've come to a new section in the Gospel of John. The actual book itself could be divided very easily into two. Um, the first half is often called the Book of Signs, and the second half, the Book of Glory. In the Book of Signs, the first half, which runs from chapters 1 through 12, it focuses on Jesus' miraculous work there. And um, in it, we can see how all of his miracles and the conversations that follow point to who Jesus is and point to um, uh, the kind of Savior that he's come to be. Now, the Book of Glory, we, are, we already have been in for a while, and uh, it divides, actually subdivides into three. The first part that we just finished is traditionally called the Farewell Discourse. That is Jesus' final teaching to his disciples and then that final high priestly prayer. Today, we're beginning in chapter 18, which begins what is called traditionally the Passion of Christ. Now, that word passion could be confusing to us today, because it generally today we use it to mean strong feelings, but that's not what it meant. It comes from an original Latin word which means suffering. And so the passion of Christ covers his suffering through his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. And that's often paired with the resurrection, which is given in chapter 20. And then finally there's an epilogue in chapter 21. So there is a very real sense in which everything we've been covering up to this point as we've journeyed through the Gospel of John has been preparing us for this. The passion of Christ and the resurrection are the very heart of the Gospel itself. What makes John extraordinary is that he often adds to details that we didn't have through reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, though I can't know for sure, I can't help but think that perhaps John did that on purpose, to supplement and extend what uh, the other Gospels have given us, to give us a fuller picture. So when they're viewed together, it's almost like uh, multiple witnesses to something that happened, the same event, each one with their own emphases, each one with what they specifically saw that happened, together giving us sort of a three-dimensional portrait of the passion of Christ. A bit like a, a jigsaw puzzle, each gospel supplies us different pieces that together give us the whole picture. And so, um, at times, we're going to look to Matthew, Mark, and Luke to add insights and observations, but we're going to primarily be following John's emphases and, and John's uh, retelling of our Lord's sacrifice. So, right now, um, we're going to just read the passage if you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18, I'm reading from the ESV version. John chapter 18, we're going to start in at verse 1. We'll read all the way to verse 14. <clears throat> John is the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Reading in at verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 1. It reads, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook, brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Judas said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that, the Lord, that he had spoken, of those whom you gave me I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high, the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. 
It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. <clears throat> so, as we go through the Passion account, we're going to find that John is focusing on two major themes. The first is Jesus as king. And the second is that Jesus is sovereign. And I don't think we see that in the entire Passion more clearly than in his arrest. Jesus' sovereignty is really obvious here. I think that's something that we need to remind ourselves in a time like now. Because um, we're living in a time of COVID-19, chaos, and societal problems. I, I, I don't even want to rehearse the details because I'm pretty sure that they're painfully obvious to each one of us. But brothers and sisters, no matter what happens, our God is in control. We can never hear that enough. So we're going to examine this morning Jesus' control of his own arrest. And we'll see how he uses that control in two different ways. And then we'll see what John wants us to, to, to learn from that and how he wants us to respond from that. I'm going to finish with a challenge for us all. So um, let's just dig in to the passage that we've already read. And uh, it begins with this transition in verse 1, as we've already said, transitioning from the, uh, the, the farewell discourse into the Passion account here. And it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. So uh, he'd finished his teaching, he'd finished that final prayer. Now they leave the city, they cross a river. And they head into a garden to get away from the, the crowds in Jerusalem for the, the feast at that time. To have some quiet time for prayer and, and for fellowship. It, the verse continue, it continues in verse 2. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So we discover that this is his normal practice. Jesus would often go to this little garden with his disciples at night. But... When you first read it and you realize that Jesus knows Judas has betrayed him, you can't help but wonder, what is he doing here? I mean, if you know someone is out to get you, you don't normally go to the places that you typically go where they can easily find you. What is, what is he up to here? He could so easily have just, um, in, in Passover time in Jerusalem, where the population of the city doubled or tripled with all the pilgrims, he could so easily just have gotten lost in the crowd. Why go to this garden? Well, unsurprisingly in verse 3, we, we read of Judas arriving with other men with him. It says, so Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And so um, the, Judas, Judas is leading this group of men, but there's no sense in which he's in charge. Uh, there's soldiers present, but actually the ones who are going to arrest Jesus are the officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. So they're the ones that are leading this. And obviously they think there could be trouble because they bring these armed soldiers with them. But they also think that maybe Jesus is going to make a run for it. So they bring lanterns and torches to kind of hunt him down in the middle of the night. This would have been a large and formidable group that Judas has brought right to where Jesus is. But verse 4 has the key to understanding what's going on in our passage. It says, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Just imagine for a moment you're one of the disciples. And, and you're in that garden spending some time in prayer alone with Jesus. And you see lights coming. And then as you look, there is a, there's Judas leading what must seem like a small army right to where you are. Can you imagine the outrage, the fear that they must have felt in that moment? But Jesus isn't surprised at all. It's really clear in our text. He knew all that would happen to him. He knew this would happen. This was part of his plan. He, he went to the garden that Judas would know he would be there. He went there on purpose because he intended to be arrested. He wanted this. But if the disciples were shocked at the arrival of Judas and these men, it was the soldiers and officers' turn to be shocked next as Jesus comes right out to them, introduces, uh, sorry, asking them, who are you looking for? Whom do you seek? 
right? It's pretty obvious, isn't it, who they were there for? With Judas right there, with the tension that he's been having with the religious leaders, with the fact that back in chapter 7 they've already tried to arrest him once. It's pretty obvious who they've come for. Jesus knew this was coming. He predicted it numerous times already. He is the only one this evening that will not be surprised by anything that happens. But more than that, throughout the events we're reading, Jesus has has a handle on the situation. He has complete control. John is starting us off and he wants us to see Jesus is in control even of his own arrest. Now that's vitally important that we bear in mind that he is in control because we need to watch what he's going to do with this control. Verse 5 continues. Jesus had just asked them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Now, it's hard to consider this even a rest because Jesus is standing. He's just handing himself right over to them. They're not having to do anything here. He's even in control of this. But if Jesus knew all that would happen, why is he asking them who they're looking for? Because he must have known that already, right? Well, he's not asking for his own sake. He's asking for their sakes. See, his question is an invitation to these men to reflect on who Jesus really is. Who are you looking for? They think he's just a man, a teacher, a troublemaker even. They really have no idea the fullness of the person standing in front of them. But in verse 6, they get the barest glimpse into who it was standing before them in the night in that garden. We see that. Look, follow along. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Why are these soldiers and officers armed to the teeth, stumbling backwards and falling when Jesus answers their question? What's going on here? Well, as I've suggested, they're getting a taste of who Jesus is. First of all, they must have been stunned by his regal and calm behavior. They've arrested people at night before. They don't generally act like Jesus is acting here. He has a natural dignity that just defies explanation in this moment. But he's also coming out to them and he's handing himself over to them. He has this this control through everything. He's giving himself up to them, even though he knows and they know that really there isn't much hope of, of justice or a fair trial for him when they're coming to nab him in the middle of the night. That's not what's going to happen. And yet he gives himself up anyway. They're shocked by his behavior. But I think in order to understand them falling back, we need to look a little deeper. See, a footnote in your ESV Bible, beside his answer, I am he, in verse 5, will tell you that he literally said, I am. Now, in the Greek language, that's perfectly fine. You can, you can, not, you can avoid saying the he, it's assumed, it's apply, implied, and, and that's grammatically correct. But when we're reading in the Gospel of John, we know that I am has a lot of significance in John. We've seen this numerous times before. It all traces back to Exodus chapter 3. Moses encounters God in a burning bush. And God sends him to free his people by God's power. And he says to him, um, he says to him, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am is God's covenantal name. It's his saving name. And in, as we've gone through John, we've c- covered over a series of seven I am statements that Jesus has made. Each one in it, Jesus is claiming that name for himself and defining the kind of God and Savior he is. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I'm the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. He even added to those seven great I am statements with another I am, where he said, before Abraham was, I am. Taken together, they are showing showing us Jesus' divinity. And they're showing us the kind of Savior he is. Now, 
on the eve of the Passover where so many years ago Moses had declared, I am will save you, Israel, and had, had by the power of God freed the Israelites from Egypt. On the eve of that day, here stands a greater Savior claiming that title, I am, for himself. I'm not sure. I'm not sure those soldiers, those men understood all of that. But the effect of that word from Christ still had power. And they drew back, stumbled, and fell at the majesty of the one standing before them. But we need to understand Jesus isn't flexing on these guys. He's pushing them to understand what's really happening here. He could easily have destroyed them in that moment. He has the power. They don't. It reminds me of Elijah. When the king sent 50 men to arrest him and bring him to there, Elijah stood there and called down fire from heaven. And two times, 50 bands of soldiers were consumed by God's wrath. Jesus is far more powerful than Elijah. As God the Son, he, his words themselves are creative. He spoke the universe into existence. By his very words, he could have undone the very existence of these men standing before him. But instead, he invites them to know his true name, not just Jesus of Nazareth, but the great I am standing before them. However, while he's in control, we've already seen he intends for this to happen. He, he intends for his arrest and his eventual crucifixion on the cross. So in verses 7 and 8, we see him uh, get a hold of the situation and smooth out their fear and their awe so that events will continue on as he, he plans. It says, so he asked them again, whom do you seek? They said to him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I'm he. So if you seek me, let these men go. You know, um, if his words sent them backwards the first time, I imagine when he asked them the second time, they were a little bit more hesitant. Whom do you seek? Uh, we're just looking for Jesus of Nazareth here. This time he repeats the same answer, but it seems that he takes the power out of it. He calms them, he soothes them, I'm he. I'm going to go with you, right? Just let these other guys go. So um, he, right now he's just, we, we wonder why does he repeat this statement? John has repeated the I am statement three times in five, verses 5, 6, and 8. He wants to make sure that we get it. We don't miss the importance and significance, significance of this. But also in this passage he's presenting us a second reason he said it. Not just to reveal that he is the great I am, but also to ensure the safety of his disciples. He's had these men repeat who they're looking for two times. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. Not them. Not the other disciples with me. Just me. You just need me. So let them go. So once more we see Jesus is securing the safety of his disciples. But I couldn't help but wondering as I studied this passage, if, if, if they really did fall backward at this little taste of Jesus' power and glory, the eternity of the one standing before them, why did they go forward with the arrest? Well, as I thought about it, this is what I concluded at least, I don't think that they could bring together the idea if Jesus was more powerful than them. I don't think that they knew that this was God in front of them, but they knew something was going on, some kind of power. So uh, I don't think that they could put that together with the fact that he was surrendering himself to them. Power and surrender just didn't click in their minds. And I don't think it clicks in minds of people today much either. And, and since he repeated the answer the second time, nothing happened when he said it that time, and he said he was going to go with them, I think they must have just chalked it up to nerves. I mean, there's a reason they brought a band of men with them. There's a reason why the arrest failed last time. Jesus is a popular figure. They were afraid coming at night like this. They were afraid that they might meet violence. They didn't know if it would go well. And they probably just said, ah, it's just our nerves. which is bothering us a little bit. But I don't say that to mean that um, Jesus didn't have a great effect on them, because I think he did. And I think that there are hints that a few of them, even in our passage, there are hints that a few of them did come to faith later as they considered more deeply upon what happened and how Jesus carried himself. Now, verse 9 um, further explains and, and solidifies why Jesus was securing his disciples in this moment. It says, 
uh, that Jesus said, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Now, a few weeks ago, we heard Jesus pray that in chapter 17. And, and he prayed that he hadn't lost any of the disciples save Judas alone, who was destined to betray Christ. And it's amazing to me that at the very beginning of Jesus' passion, the great suffering that he'll go through for the next uh, couple days, that um, his primary concern is securing the safety, not of himself, but of his disciples. And this literally being minutes before they all abandon him and scatter and run in fear. In this passage, we haven't repeatedly seen just simply that Jesus excuse me, is in control. We've also seen that he's teaching through his arrest. He's teaching a few things. He has uh, given his captors a taste of who he really is and reminded his disciples of his power even in this moment. He's also given them that last glimpse of his tender care for them as they can see him making sure that they get out of there safely, even though he himself is uh, being arrested. And no doubt that's a memory that would have come back to their minds, may even been burned into their memories in the next few days as they ponder how they abandoned him before they see him again in the resurrection and the joy is restored. But Jesus' calm control and his teaching heart are, are kind of uh, interrupted by an outburst from Peter in verse 10. See, uh, here uh, we read that uh, Peter, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Peter was apparently armed as well, and when his captors let their guard down, thinking that everything was calm and under control, he pulls his sword and chops off the guy's ear. Now, make no mistake... Peter wasn't aiming for the ear. He's a fisherman, not a swordsman. He was probably trying to cut him, kill him by striking him in the head, but the man dodged and he caught just his ear. Peter knows that it is absolutely suicidal at this point to try to fight. This whole band of well-armed soldiers, just as a fisherman. He isn't really trying to save Jesus so much as he's trying to go out in a blaze of glory for Jesus. Now, you probably already know Peter lives. They don't arrest him, and they don't kill him for that. But we might wonder why when we read this, right? I mean, soldiers aren't generally known for mercy or kindness, and Peter would just attack them. Now, ultimately, Peter remains safe because of Jesus, because Jesus said he would be safe, and Jesus is in control and sovereignly makes sure. But God still works through means, and we have no reason to think of some kind of miraculous escape here. But we do have reason to think of a miracle. Because Luke adds a detail that John didn't add. Luke tells us after J Peter's attack, but Jesus said no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. In the chaos, Jesus healed this servant named Malchus. And we're not sure if maybe um, the, the, uh, the uh, troops, seeing that he wasn't hurt, thought maybe Peter missed, or maybe they saw the miracle themselves. And uh, Malchus said, hey, don't arrest him. Nothing happened to me. We're not sure which way it went. But in any case, Peter gets free. But I want to take a se second and just look at Malchus. Because maybe the uh, soldiers kind of skipped over and said, ah, he, he must have missed you. Didn't really hit your ear after all. But Malchus knew. He felt the pain. He knew what happened to him. Malchus was also the servant of the high priest. He knew his Bible. He knew at Passover time that God introduced himself as the great I am who came to save his people. I think he caught what Jesus was saying just a little bit. And after being healed and seeing how Jesus carried himself, I don't know this for sure. This is my own personal belief. But I think Malchus came to faith eventually after he heard of the resurrection and the gospel. How else do we have his name? Malchus isn't a famous character. We have no record of him anywhere in history aside from this. I think we know him because he joined the community of Christians and they remembered Malchus who had come as one of Jesus' uh, captors to arrest him, been healed, and then later been saved. That's my idea at very least. So take it for what it's worth. But if Malchus came to an understanding of what was going on, at this moment, Peter has no understanding 
of what's going on. All I think Peter has going in his head are those words that Jesus said to him back in chapter 13, echoing in his head. Peter had said to him, I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Peter was determined not to deny his Lord, and so he pulled his sword and he fought. But once, but he had it all wrong. You know, maybe in a sense it was brave of Peter to be willing to die for Jesus, but in another very real sense it was completely wrong, misguided and sinful to attack that man as he was, as Jesus points out in verse 11. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Once more, Jesus rebukes Peter. Um, if Christ has been trying to teach his disciples in this moment in the arrest, they are not getting it. They are missing the point. He was handing himself over to them. And if they were really following him, if they really were obeying him, they would have let him do what he wanted to do. But instead, Peter tried to stop him, tried to stop the whole thing. Besides, really, really, Peter, if Jesus was just able to, with his words, make all those men fall down backwards, did he really need your help? I think as we look at the rebuke, Jesus doesn't use logical arguments like that. Instead, he points him to something even greater. And he says, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? That's a reference to the prayer that he made in the garden before Judas arrived. A prayer that John doesn't record. But we can see in some of the other Gospels. He prayed, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. John didn't record that agonizing prayer of Christ in the garden as he viewed the suffering he was going to go through on the cross, bearing the sin of the world on himself. He didn't record that prayer where Jesus submitted to the will of God, instead, his Father. Instead, he recorded his confidence and that submission, to his resolve to follow through with the eternal plan for our redemption. That's what he records. But here, in rebuking Peter, we see a taste of it. John knew about that prayer. We see a taste of it. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? See, Peter missed the point of the entire reason why he came to this earth. He didn't come to lead a rebellion. He didn't come to fight with swords. He came to drink the cup of wrath. Wrath of God over our sins to save his people. And so, we see he came to die. In chapters 12, verses 12 and 13, we could read of the soldiers arresting Jesus. They take him to the chief priests for questioning. But I want to zoom in on chapter, in verse 14, where Caiaphas, the high priest, John reminds us that while he is, no doubt, the greatest enemy, human enemy of Jesus at this point, he also made a prophecy. God prophesied through him a true thing. And, and John reminds us in verse 14, it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be better that one man should die for the people. Now, when Caiaphas said that, he meant it's better that we just kill Jesus so we can maintain the status quo and our cozy position with the authorities. Let's not risk the good thing we have here. But God, through Caiaphas, meant something so much more. You see... Jesus chose to die for the people. He would come to drink that cup. He would come to be the offering for sin. He would come to die in our place. If you're a true believer this morning, you know that. You've had that moment in your life where you have re repented of your sin, recognizing your unworthiness before God. And you've just laid it out and you have placed your trust fully in Christ who bled and died on the cross for your sin and for my sin. And through belief, you've been saved. Now, if you're not saved this morning, I think I'd like to call you just to look on Christ. Look on how he's been, he's been handling himself in the middle of his arrest. He went there on purpose. His purpose is to show us and to teach us his love and his mercy for each one of us through dying on the cross for us. And will you, will you see it? And will you 
let it change your life. Now, if you're saved this morning, I'm calling on you to look on his steady determination to head toward the cross to die for us, to see his love and grace and to let them once more lead you to marvel and to worship his name. And I, I, I think that what John wants us to see is if this is how Christ has control, and this is the kinds of things he does with his control, to show us his character and his love and to even die for us, that, then we should entrust ourselves to a Savior like that. We should entrust ourselves to Jesus. You know what? He is just as much in control today as he was so many years ago. We're going through a hard time right now. There's a lot of chaos in the world. There's a lot of sin. And yet, God is always able to work within human failings, and yes, even within our sin, to bring his will out. Have you been trusting him through these times, or have you been struggling with worry and anxiety and stress? You know, if you have nothing to fear with him on your side, he will keep you just like he kept his disciples safe. He can do that no matter what happens. His purpose in going to the cross shows us his will for you and his will for me is good. It might lead us through hard times. It might be difficult. We might not even understand what's happening. But he loves us. And if he was willing to die on a cross for us, we can trust him with all of our lives. But you know, as I've been contemplating this passage, it's actually the middle point that really God has been uh, um, bringing conviction into my life for. Because Christ is always teaching. If he's teaching important lessons in the middle of his own arrest, he is teaching us still today. He's always searching to grow our faith. 2020 has been hard, and I've been watching a lot of memes online where it's just like people just want it to end. We're all going to be glad when 2020 is over, right? This has not been a good year for many of us. But my question is, are we just waiting for this to be over? Are we just waiting to get back to normal? Or are we listening? Because Jesus is trying to teach us through these times. He's trying to reach us in the middle of all of this. He's always interested in our growth more than our comfort. And he uses difficult circumstances to bring his people to greater maturity. But sometimes we're like Peter. We don't like the direction things are heading, so we start to fight against it. Or sometimes we're like those soldiers. We get this sense of, maybe, maybe God is trying to tell me something in this moment. But I got things to do. We don't t stop and take the time to try to discern and understand what God is trying to teach us. And we miss out on something really, really important. God is trying to teach us through the difficulties of this year. If I were to ask you, what's he been teaching you? What would you answer? What's he been teaching you this year? What's he been teaching you this month? What's he been teaching you in your quiet time alone, alone with the Lord over the last couple days? What is God teaching you? I'd like to suggest a few lessons, a couple lessons, on what he might be teaching us as a church. Uh, at times like this, church service is a lot different. We went for a long stretch where we couldn't meet together at all. And now as we do meet together, it's a lot different, isn't it? It's a lot more sparse. Fellowship is harder when you're doing it through a screen or when you're looking at each other through masks, it's not quite the same, is it? And also, the worship service itself isn't quite the same. I don't know about you, but I really miss singing. I'm sure you do too. It's harder. It's not the same. But my challenge for us this morning is this. Are these things that we're missing, were they really what it was about? Did we come on Sundays just to see the people that we know and love? Is that the only reason? Did we only enjoy worship service because we get to sing really great songs and we have some really wonderful and talented worship leaders? Is that why we do it? Or do we come to worship the one who died in our place on the cross? Do we come because he commands us to gather as a body and then we are privileged to obey him and worship him together? I'm not saying it's wrong to feel and grieve even, to lament the loss of these other things or, or at least the decrease of them. We should, I am. But maybe God is disrupting our lives, disrupting the status quo because we were just kind of cruising along. Maybe we got our priorities a little bit wrong and he wants us to consider 
and hear him and realign our hearts to the heart of worship once more. Now, I, I, I recognize, of course, that um, some people aren't here for good reason this morning. First of all, we've got a 40-person cap, and it's awesome that we reached our cap, I think, for the first time. But some people aren't here, and I'm not saying they don't have good reason. Some, some of us are susceptible to the virus. Some of us are caring for those who are. And you're not here because of that. I understand that. Some of us, too, are, aren't here because they think the virus is particularly dangerous and they're doing everything humanly possible to stay home. And I respect that, if that's your belief. But I'm talking to the people. I, I really want to to dig in, not just on all of us, because we all need to consider this, but I want to dig in a little, if you'll let me, on those of you who aren't here because you think, without singing and without fellowship, what's the point? Is that really what we came for, right? Maybe God is taking these things away from us because it's supposed to be about Him, not them. See, it's not supposed to be about our convenience and our comfort either. It's supposed to be about Jesus, the question is, will we learn the lessons God is trying to teach us in this moment? Now, that one's been on my heart. It's a little bit further from our passage. Another lesson, which is more in line with what we're reading this morning, is that God has been trying to teach us by shaking the foundations of the things we trust in, the things that we look to for security. We tend to find our security in finances, in, uh, in, our, in um, our, our health. We tend to find security in our social networks and even in society at large. But God has been shaking a lot of these things in ways that none of us could have ever have predicted in 2020, hasn't he? He's been taking the things that we often look to and he's been reminding us that these things are not good foundations for our trust. We need God. We need him in good times when none of those things are endangered and we need him when those things are on the line. We need him all the time. We need his guidance. We need his power. We need his strength. We were made for him. We need him. Who'd have thought 2020 would turn out the way it has? You know, the future can change so quickly. And when things go from good to bad, you find out in a hurry where your confidence has been placed. I think many of us are discovering it wasn't quite as centered on Christ as we thought. And this is an opportunity for us to reorient ourselves, to get back to basics, to realize that if we are depending upon anything else aside from Jesus, they will disappoint us in the end, but he won't. So, brothers and sisters, let's make Sure, our trust is centered where it is supposed to be, in Christ alone, through good and through bad. Now, those are a couple questions that maybe God is trying to, to, to bring before us and to teach us through. But I have little doubt that there are other things that God is trying to teach us as a church and each of us individually as he knows what we need to learn. The question is, as he's trying to teach us, are we listening or are we just waiting for all of this to come to an end so we can get back to normal? May God move us to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear his lessons for us this day and every day. And may he reach us to be just encouraged, seeing his control even in the midst of his arrest, that he use that control to further draw out faith from us by showing us who he is and by pressing events so that they would lead to the cross where he could die to redeem us and then be resurrected. May we see all that and entrust ourselves, our entire lives, to him more and more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, as we look at Jesus' arrest, there was a lot of little details in that, but they point to one great truth. And the great truth is that we can trust you. But God, a sad truth is we often don't. Lord, convict our hearts. Call us back to greater trust and greater obedience to you. 
Father, uh, we pray that any idols in our lives, any things that we've been looking to for security aside from you would be torn down. This is a hard period for the world. Some of us are really feeling that this morning. God, we pray for those who are particularly struggling. Father, for mercy, but in the midst of it, more than for their comfort, we pray that you would work your way in them, that you would have your way in their lives, and that they would learn those lessons so that they might grow, each one of us, we might grow up more into our salvation so that we might follow you more and we might tell other people about one who bled and died for my sins and for theirs. God, give us a heart to take this gospel, worship you for it, and to share it with others. We pray this in Jesus' name.